Hello everyone, my name is Chris Lynn and I work for Gahan and Long Archaeological Consultancy. I am one of the directors responsible for a large site in Downpatrick, consisting of a famine cemetery and adjacent fields to do the work of it. This investigation is being carried out on behalf of the Department of Education and the site will be the eventual location of Down High School. An initial evaluation of the graveyard took place in 2008, but the current project began in summer 2019. Work was halted for more than a year due to the COVID pandemic and the project will continue into 2022. This presentation will be a brief update of the findings and there's still more to be covered from the site. The site itself is located on the bend of the River Coyle. Topographically, the site slopes from roughly Central Ridge down towards the Coyle River to the north and towards the Shankford Road to the south. The eastern part of the site is dominated by a steep hill which overlooks the rest of the site. The workhouse graveyard, shaded in red, is located on the southern extent of the site. The graveyard is overlooked immediately to the east by a retirement home, once the location of Coyle Hospital at the 19th century workhouse. A second workhouse graveyard is present at the eastern portion of the site. It will not be impacted on by the proposed development and eventually the excavated human remains will be reburied close to it. No other archaeological sites were identified in the development area, although the site may have been part of a battle that took place at Coral Bridge between Williamite and Jacobite forces in 1689. No evidence of this battle has so far been uncovered. To give it a background for the graveyard itself, a review of the Vine Patrick Workhouse records, the Guardian's minute books, and Workhouse registers was conducted and provided no information as to when the graveyard was first used. However, records from the Vine Patrick recorder, provided to us by Vinwell McCormick, show the graveyards in use from 1849 at the latest and had been replaced by the new graveyard in 1851. An establishment during the fever of 1847 is probable. During the famine, starvation was not the cause of the greatest mortality, but famine induced illnesses such as typhus and relapsing fever. The occupants of the graveyard itself could have come from all over County Down and may have been neighbours, weavers, or fishermen. The Down Patch Recorder also provides information that the remains were potentially exhumed from the graveyard for reinterment elsewhere. Here is a pre-excavation photo of the graveyard. It was very overgrown with scrub vegetation and trees. The eastern part of the graveyard had been used by the adjacent hospital as a dump, and in places up to two metres of hospital waste had to be removed. And here is a photo of the top side removed from the site. It was very difficult to ascertain individual grave cuts due to the nature of the natural and the sheer number of individuals buried within it. This is a fairly up to date aerial shot of the graveyard. So far, 730 individuals have been removed. Burials are present throughout the graveyard apart from the southeast corner, which is the area shaded in red. This may have been due to the remains of a stone building present in this area. Other archaeological structures and deposits have been identified beneath the burials, which probably relate to the activity on the rest of the site. The grave cuts in the northwest corner are organised and contain only one individual per grave cut. The number of individuals within one grave cut increases within south, and in the southwest corner, Pits getting up to 12 individuals were found. The northeast corner is again more organised, with more distinct grave cuts. On average, six individuals are indicated in each grave cut. Individuals are buried on a west east orientation, wherein the head was placed at the west end of the grave cut. This is typical for Christian burial. However, Eight individuals were buried with their heads at the east end of the grave cut. 
This might indicate a connection with the church, or perhaps, given limited space within the graveyard, this was an attempt to fit more coffins into the grave cuts. These eight individuals were dispersed throughout the graveyard and are not all located in one area. Sex assessment has been limited on site, given the poor preservation of the skeletons. But, from the data collected so far, it appears that there are more females and males buried in the graveyard. This may change when post-sex analysis begins. Pathology will be examined more closely in post-sex as well. Given the severe conditions within the workhouse, it is likely that many diseases will not have manifested within the skeletal remains, and will therefore be invisible. Evidence that all individuals were buried in coffins is abundant. The majority of skeletons have nails adjacent or mixed in with them. Usually only the lowest burial has any surviving coffin wood. Occasionally it might appear that individuals were buried together, but this is due to a skeleton on an upper level collapsing down on top of a lower one. A number of individuals exhibit evidence for these shrouds. Approximately six pins have been found on both children and adults, and additional skeletons suggest that some were bound in a shroud. Occasionally, a few better preserved elements of individuals were found, such as the hair remaining of the skull of this individual in the top left photo. The top right photo shows the current excavation conditions, which is generally pretty damp due to the graveyard being situated down slope from the main site and water draining into it. Each assessment is limited on site, but it's clear that all ages are present. Infants are typically found within the legs and not of. Infants are also located in coffins with older children, but only a small number being buried within their own coffin. Smaller coffins are made to accommodate young children. Children make up roughly 30% of the total number of individuals found so far. Burials belonging to children are most abundant on the east and west walls of the graveyard, which could be related to a space issue whereby smaller coffins were placed along the walls when use of the central area of the graveyard intensified. Very few artifacts were recovered from the burials, as would be expected from a workhouse graveyard. Rosary beads attached to a possible pen across were recovered, a few cover buttons and a ring. The ring was found in the right hand on the fourth finger of a young woman. The ring is undirected and likely made from a zinc and copper alloy. The lower picture shows it like a bracelet, which is found in the backfill of one of the graves. A few flint artifacts were also recovered from the backfill of the graves, and reminds us that the graves were dug in the pre existing archaeology. Moving on to the main area of excavation to the north of the graveyard, the site was subject to initial phase of test trenching. Archaeology is identified in pretty much every single test trench and more focused testing confirmed the presence of a substantial amount of archaeology. The site was divided into seven areas. Several large portions of the site can be observed in tissue, which are the areas marked in brown on the plan. Archaeology found in these areas will still be planned and recorded. Archaeology is almost certainly present in the areas marked in green, but they've been deemed too badly damaged by modern dumping or farming. Here is an overall plan of what has been found so far on site. The areas can be roughly divided into primary industry and primary settlement. The central portion of the site appears to be surrounded by a rampart close to 500 metres in total length. To the east of this area is a hill with a large ditch over 15 metres in width. A path extends up this hill from the south, flanked by a pair of smaller ditches. Unfortunately, the top of the hill is beyond the limits of excavation. The western part of the site contains multiple paths on a wall that extends for about 400 metres from south to north to north east, 
with gaps ready past the crossover. It does not appear in Area 7, which is the area to the northeast. There does not appear to be any difference in structure types on either side of this wall. This is a drone photograph showing several buildings under excavation. In the background, you can see a path extending towards the current excavation area. A wall is also present extending south to north. The types of structure can be divided into three broad types. Houses, storage buildings, and conjoined buildings, with a few unique buildings scattered in. This is a slightly larger example of a typical house, consisting of two pits with surrounding posts and stake holes. The majority of houses are oval or sub oval in shape. This particular structure has an internal area of about 25 metres squared. Most structures have two edges, usually opposite each other, marked by gravel or flat stones thrown into the house lot. A substantial number of stones were excavated from the house lot, perhaps representing stone packing for postals would not leave an impact on the natural. Here is an example of another two houses excavated. Occasionally a gap is left in the house lot for the entrance, or the house contains a large pit perhaps used for storage rather than a hearth, as it contained very little charcoal. Generally, these houses have few parallels within Ireland, with the closest being the various Scandinavian house types found in Dublin and other Viking towns. However, any similarities are due to the urban nature of the site, rather than the direct link. Houses of this ship are fairly common in continental Western Europe, from the late Bronze Age to the Roman area. This is an example of a typical storage building, which is generally subsurfacer in shape and about half the size of the probable houses. They usually contain a large pit taking up most of the internal area of the building. Often this pit was dug out first and the slot with the building cutting through it. Usually these types of buildings are found in industrial areas or off to the one side in settlement areas. Conjoined buildings are the least common of the building types identified on site. Typically, they are of a figure of eight shape and at least 10 metres in length. This makes them the large side in comparison to similar buildings from the early medieval period. The largest uncovered so far is over 20 metres in length. The back part of the buildings seems to have had an industrial function and there are usually multiple entrances, perhaps suggesting a communal use for the building. This is a drone photograph of the previous building. To the left of the photograph, or south of the structure, you can see the remains of another stub oval structure, built just over a metre away from the main figure of eight structure. Several paths and sunken roads or hallways have been identified throughout the site. The path shown in the top photograph is just over one metre wide and was flanked its entire length by double row post holes. The lower photograph shows a road about three metres wide and its base contained two shallow grooves that may have functioned as drains. It too was flanked its entire length of post holes, so this time only a single row. Interestingly, this road extends towards the current bridge over the river coil. A single ball has been identified on site, with a total length of 400 metres. Only a rubble core with an occasional substantial stone survives, and it generally has a width of 1.5 to 2 metres. 
So when it's widest, it can be three meters. Where tested, post holes and stake holes were found within it, perhaps suggesting it was originally timber laced. The rampart encloses the central portion of the site. It consists of several thousand post holes of usually uniform shape, 0 0.2 meters in diameter, 0 0.3 meters in depth, with the case of a larger or smaller example, with a width of about 3 meters and a length of 500 meters. The post holes seem to be set in every 0 0.3 meters. There is a gravel core in the rampart, in front of which a shallow gully is excavated, which contains more post holes but not as frequent. The rampart may receive been similar to the Gelheim type style. Over 40 furnaces and kilns have been identified on site of diverse types. Style tapping furnaces appear to be most common. There is one or two unique examples. The furnace on the top right photograph is located in a 1.5 meter deep rectangular pit similar to Gallic or Gallo-Roman types. The furnace on the bottom right is located inside a stone structure adjacent to a large pit which probably serves the well. Over 120 buildings have so far been identified on site, with the process that number reaching closer to 200 before the site is finished. The majority appear to respect one another in the various paths and ball that make up the settlement. In the area pictured above, 41 buildings of all three types previously mentioned have been identified. Broad patterns can be recognised, such as the three joint buildings situated next to one another. This would be one of the most densely populated sites so far found in pre Viking Ireland. The structures marked in red are earlier features in the Bronze Age. Have been built on top of by this later prehistoric activity. The early to middle branch activity is located to the west and northwest of the site, sitting on the crest of a slope overlooking the river coil. The activity consists solely of ring ditches and other burial activities. In total, seven ring ditches have been identified but many have been truncated by later prehistoric buildings and modern farming activities. However, a largely intact colour urn was recovered from a central pit within one of the ring ditches, given a broad date of 2000 to 1500 BC for this period of the site. The urn contained cremated bone and a flint arrowhead selected from the pyre. Excluding the branch activity, what exactly is the site of St. Patrick? The site continues beyond the limit of excavation and the very least extends between the bend of recoil and potentially beyond. This would make it into the Fluvial Hill Fort, but at roughly 25 hectares is fairly at the large side for the the site. The current bridge of the recoil may have actually or historically been the shallowest point across the river. In which case, this settlement would have stopped on the main route bay extending north to south. Potentially, this could be a territorial oppidum, if not on its own, then with its archaeological setting of St. Patrick. I assume the previous lecture, Materializing Power, New Archaeology of the Black Things Dyke, went into this concept. With that, I would like to thank the crew. For their continuing hard work on site. Special thanks to Bethany Johnson, who is my co-director for this site. I would also like to congratulate Dave Cocky and the birth of a son Leo. I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation.